so uh, my name is Raghu Ganti. Uh, I'm from IBM Research, and uh, today I'll be talking about how do we scale uh, uh, PyTorch FSDP uh, on uh, you know, uh, IBM Cloud using Ethernet. So before I jump into you know, how do we uh, uh, use FSDP and what's the, what are the key contributions that we have done, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, why do this and what is the importance for IBM here. So these are a little bit of a, like a five-minute spiel on what, found, what we call as foundation models. I'm sure people have heard about it. Uh, Stanford introduced this, uh, coined this term probably last year sometime, end of last year, called foundation models. Uh, very simple. I think everybody has heard about it in the NLP domain. Okay. So uh, this is a short, small story, uh, basically saying that, look, you know, you had your in 1980s or so, you had your expert systems, then you moved to machine learning, your SVMs and whatnot. You had deep learning starting in 2010s and up till 2017, 2018, and that evolved into what we are calling as foundation models. Basically, it's deep learning, but on steroids in some ways. Uh, it is, the, the key shift is that you're now looking at learning data representations as opposed to trying a specific task. Uh, and the hallmark of these foundation models is you do self-supervised learning and at scale and using a massive unlabeled data. So what does this mean? It means that um, uh, it means that models are getting really large. So if you look at, this is just a graph in the last five years, right? I mean, people started with this AlexNet and uh, ResNet, which were at one point the largest models out there. It's very successful, even today they are used in many production places. But since then, uh, models have just grown exponentially. So today, if you look at it, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard about uh, Palm, which was released by Google. And uh, I think Microsoft has this, uh, Microsoft and NVIDIA have this one trillion parameter model, right? So there are hundreds of billions and trillion parameter models out there. And uh, the, qu the question is, how do you train them efficiently? And from our standpoint, from IBM's standpoint, what we are seeing is a paradigm shift. It's not just these, uh, that the models are becoming larger. It is also the modalities in which they're applicable is becoming wider. So this is an example from our own internal workloads where uh, we have applied it to industry 4.0, which is around time series data. And there are problems in this scenario where you know, we have tackled this problem for 10 years. We have the best models based on SMEs, based on standard um, uh, machine learning and some deep learning. And foundation models and transformers combined, they change the game. We are seeing improvements in 10% in uh, you know, F1 scores in some places. We're seeing improvements in like half uh, of the MSE. And in many other cases, so I'm just giving examples across different industries. The bottom line is foundation models are changing the game for us and our clients. So what we are doing is uh, looking at, of course, a br much broader lens. I'm giving an example from time series domain, but we are looking at you know, IT operations, uh, sensor data, geospatial and weather, chemistry and materials, and a whole bunch of different aspects. Uh, and applying foundation models in all these domains, and we'll, I'm sure we'll be sharing more results uh, in you know sooner. But in order to enable all of these, because these are different verticals and these are coming from different client needs, uh, what are we doing is we're building a stack, a middleware for enabling these foundation models with PyTorch at its heart. And there are different challenges. I'm not going to go into detail. This is just to give you an overview that there is a stack that enables our foundation model building, and the core of it is uh, PyTorch enablement. And PyTorch is the heart of and how do we scale, how do we get to those larger numbers. So that's where PyTorch FSDP comes in. Of course, DDP, I think, is fairly mature. Everybody you know, knows that. I don't need to you know, preach to the choir here. Uh, DDP is working well, and I'm sure I'm going to go explore the compile option and to make it faster and better. But with FSDP, you know, how far, what is the size of the models that we can go to? Our constraints have been, look, I mean, this is like a little bit of a, I'm going to skip this part because uh, all I want to point out here is that FSDP has more communication. And given that IBM Cloud's networking today is only Ethernet based, we were in a dilemma that when we started uh, you know, trying to think about scaling, there was this 
little bit of a fear that, oh, you know, you're an Ethernet, there is no way you'll be able to scale. Forget about, uh, you know, 10 billion or 100 billion is in your dreams, 10 billion is also not possible. That was basically where we were six months ago. And if you look at FSDP, the number of communications is more, so you're starting to worry about network becoming a major bottleneck, right? So what, if you start looking at, you know, get into one layer deeper, we open up the hood of uh, DDP or FSDP, the beauty of it is overlapping computation and communication. So there's a beautiful you know, picture. If you are in this, this land, it is perfection, and there is no problem at all. Uh, but if you are in a slightly different land, and I'm going to show you an example, this is an example where it is like, really bad. Uh, this is where we started, by the way. We were at 20% efficiency. So I want to just start, stop back, geek out on you a little bit, and say, if I look at you know, uh, T5 as an architecture, which everybody and maybe many people are familiar with, if I like take T5, uh, what I want you to follow over here is one thing, the last, but, uh, last two lines here. Everything else is just a matter of getting to the last two lines. So there is a compute uh, time you're taking. There is a communication time you're taking. If they are overlapping each other and there is no peaking out of communication, you are in the you know, good zone. Ideally, you want compute to be much more than communication. That would be the ideal scenario. So what we're observing is if you look at the computation to communication ratio for a model, so this is applicable to T5 family of models. Uh, specifically the T511B. You can get this math for everything. There is a deeper technical blog that's coming out which will you know, tell you how you can do it. Uh, this is based on, of course, NVIDIA's um, uh, analysis in the past. It's not something we came up with. But the compute to communication ratio is something that I want to focus on, which is, if you look at it, it's really dependent on the batch size and the sequence length. So these are the two primary knobs that drive how much compute you take on the GPU. And they are the dominant terms. I mean, they're looking at whatever some, there are some other terms, but they're not relevant. So as long as I'm able to keep that compute busy, I will be able to get a better compute to communication ratio. So this is sort of to give you an idea of what are the trade-offs here. So if I increase my batch size, uh, and this, these are some interesting trade-offs. So if you think about it, if I increase my batch size, it increases the amount of compute, but it does not affect the network at all. What is going on the network, what is flowing on the network are gradients, but the batch size is what dictates what happens to the uh, compute. And I'm sure you heard about Saumat when he talked like, hey, GPUs are getting faster and faster. Uh, the funny thing is that the H100, which is much faster than the A100, does not increase in memory, which is very surprising to me. Hey, we need to increase NVIDIA GPU memories, right? So sequence length also is the same behavior. It increases compute linearly, but it does not affect communication. Whereas the model size is, has this weird thing that happens where it does increase compute, it increases memory, and it increases communication. So, but when you look at memory pressure, increasing the model size, when we go from 3 billion to 11 billion in case of um, uh, you know, T5, the memory requirements of the model does not grow four times, it only grows two times. So which is sort of an interesting thing. It's not like a linear increase in terms of memory requirements that the model drives, but the computational increases are linear. So it's very nice to see that you can keep growing that compute faster and you can keep it busier. But memory is something that is very, you know, uh, um, uh, very important to keep in mind. So what we did was, you know, looked at Ethernet. The, the, the interesting thing about Ethernet is, at the end of the day, you're not looking at uh, bandwidth here. You're looking at latency, and I'll show you some numbers of why that matters. Uh, what we did was, uh, thanks to the FSDP team, uh, we were able, able to add the rate limiter flag. Uh, what rate limiter does is lets you control the amount of reserved memory that is uh, allocated by PyTorch that goes for communication. So if you are using an InfiniBand, which is a much lower latency network, you would want that reserved memory to be higher so that you can communicate more uh, per you know, second. Whereas with Ethernet, you want the reserved memory to be lower because I want my computation to be longer. So with that flag, we can control the, that knob. And what happens is what you see is before picture and the after picture looks somewhat like this where the top is all uh, compute, and uh, the blue curves uh, in the right side picture on 
whichever way you think about it, the after picture is the communication. So the before picture has communication in, in orange, which is clearly speaking out and resulting in very poor scaling. And with this, if I start scale, you know, looking at it at a much uh, uh, larger scale, so this is basically going from uh, single node comparison to 64 nodes, so 512 GPUs, and these are all 800 GPUs. Uh, what we see is with uh, before FSDP rate limiter was introduced, 11B was at roughly 20%, so very extremely poor. I would never recommend to train on 20% efficiencies. Uh, with the introduction of rate limiter on Ethernet, we are able to go to uh, close to 95% for 3 billion. For 11 billion at 512 GPUs, we are at like 85%. We've even identified some more improvements that can be done, which will take us to 90% or so. So these are all scaling numbers that are with respect to a single uh, node. So if I add network, what is the overhead that I'm getting? There are more details that, again, there is an upcoming blog that we'll go into. Uh, from a teraflops, pure utilization perspective of the hardware, that's also pretty good. Uh, what we see is um, uh, before FSDP rate limiter, our teraflop utilization was pretty low. This is for 11B. When we go uh, to add uh, you know, the rate limiter flag, a teraflop utilization is around 100 teraflops or so uh, in, at, at, say, 32 nodes, uh, basically which is what we are planning on from a production standpoint when we are training 11 billion model, we, you know, 256 GPUs are more than enough. And now comes the interesting part here, which I mean, so far it is also you know, the top level numbers, but when we dig deeper, start measuring um, the NVLink utilization, intra-node connectivity utilization as well here, right? Uh, what we see is um, within the node, the bandwidth is utilization is uh, very little. I mean, these NV links are at uh, 300 Gbps capital B one, one way, and uh, so you get a 600 Gbps aggregate bandwidth. Uh, with uh, introduction of NV link, uh, we are only using like 40 Gbps. Uh, whereas if you look at internode connectivity, the numbers are also similar. Uh, that's what you would expect because uh, FSDP or DDP is a very synchronous system in terms of what it's exchanging. And internode connectivity, we are looking at a peak utilization of 30 Gbps. This is a small b, and average of around 20 Gbps. So basically, my point is, look, bandwidth is not your biggest concern, especially at a 10 billion uh, uh, sweet spot. Primarily, again, because of um, the design of how you're continuously doing communication and computation. So what is happening here is that you really don't you need to focus on how do I do latency better and those uh, optimization trade-offs that I was talking about. How do we do those optimization trade-offs better? So I want to be able to squeeze more memory uh, for computation if I have a lower latency network and use that in a better way. Okay, so that's... All right, so I think, I don't know. I don't know how, long, how am I doing with time. All right, great. So basically, what are the key takeaways, right? There is this complex trade-offs with um, the batch size, uh, sequence length, and model size, and they do have significant interplays. With FSDP, we are also you know, beginning to talk to the FSDP core team on understanding how the graph cutting of FSDP is going to play a role. It plays a significant role today. It's manual graph cutting. Uh, I think there is ways in which you can, for more um, uh, you know, mundane or humble Ethernet uh, linked systems, you'll have to play with these parameters in a cleaner way. Of course, the golden mantra that takeaway is increase batch size and sequence length, so you will be able to get better GPU utilization. So if you want to train on not just 2048, but go for you know, 8192, go for it, uh, if you have lower latency, uh, higher latency lengths. And what we have shown is 11B, these are, this is an Ethernet stack, TCP IP, with no optimizations whatsoever. So uh, that is basically something that is, works very well. And the other thing I do want to point out here is all of this were done in containers. So this was done uh, using Kubernetes. And uh, uh, you know, primarily, that plays a significant. Don't think that Kubernetes is adding a significant overhead. Yeah, you can optimize them. There are some flags and some optimizations that you need to do to get there. But um, uh, with Kubernetes, with all your extra layers of overhead, you'll still be able to scale quite well 
when you go to, say, 11 billion parameter models. Uh, what are the things that we need to do in the future? Uh, as obviously, you know, going to larger and larger models, what are, where are the limits? We need to test that. Uh, what happens when we introduce new training accelerators? Uh, I'm sure you see, you've seen how the industry is going more and more towards creating these hardware accelerators for uh, AI training inference. How do we you know, optimize there in, in that context? And finally, I think I would say uh, you know, there have been studies that have been done in terms of uh, compute optimal training. Uh, in this case, I want to call out compute communication optimal training. That would be the challenge that I would pose to this community. How do we determine what is the compute communication optimal training, which, where, the, where are the limits, and what would be the size of the data sets that we see? Uh, because there is still the open question of is larger better? It's not very clear. Uh, definitely there is you know, larger from a, going from 100 million to 100 billion, there is improvement. But what happens in between? How does data affect? How does, uh, you know, uh, uh, other aspects of training affect things, right? So larger is better is still an open question. So having a compute communication optimal training will help us democratize uh, training of large models, put it in the hands of more people. And I think that's something which, uh, as a community, we want to do. That would be my final message. So with that, I think, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, with that, these are a few links. There are, there's a blog out there. There's a rate limiter PR. There's an in-depth technical blog coming out from PyTorch, so stay tuned. And I'll hand it over to Thomas, who will be my next speaker. Thank you.